This is your 331 front load about genetic inheritance and diseases. In this activity, we've talked about some definitions, some terms such as dominant and recessive. You might have heard of the word dominant before, and whenever you think of that word I, I, for genetics, I want you guys to think of something that will dominate or mask another trait. This is represented, these traits are represented by capital letters, and the traits that are recessive or hidden in our DNA are usually represented with a lowercase letter. There are a few, few rules when it comes to dominant versus recessive, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Here are a few examples. Um, two capital S's is considered dominant, one capital, one lowercase, that's still considered a dominant trait, and then two lowercases, that's how you uh, represent recessive. We've previously talked about sickle cell anemia, we've talked about recessive means you inherit uh, one trait from your mom, one trait from your dad. We're now going to use the definition allele. It's kind of a funny word, um, but an allele means different versions of a trait. So when you think about humans, physical appearance, think about hair color. We've got red hair color, blonde, brown, black, all sorts of mixtures in between. Those are all hair color, but because there's different versions of hair color, we call those alleles. So an allele is a different version of a gene. Uh, a common term you can use Think about different gaming devices like Xbox, Xbox One, Xbox 360, Xbox Connect. Those are all different versions of the same thing in Xbox. So we could say those are alleles of one another. The only way you'll be able to tell if, be able to see a trait that is considered recessive is if that person has both traits inherited from each parent, uh, the recessive trait. So in order to be recessive, you can't have any dominant traits in your genotype for that specific trait, like hair color. Uh, scientists, they determine which traits are dominant and recessive based off of a really old experiment done by Gregor Mendel, and he used pea plants in order to determine this. Uh, we could get more in depth about that, but understand that his basic experiment um, a long time ago still is true today about genetics when it comes to which one's dominant versus recessive. That brings us to our next set of vocabulary terms, genotype and phenotype. These two are very often confused and mixed up, but I'm going to help you figure out a way to remember which one's which. When you think of phenotype, I want you to think of the physical appearance or the physical appearance of a trait of something. For example, your eye color and your hair color. Instead of saying, oh, you have a dominant or recessive phenotype, we would say, oh, you have black hair or you have red hair. It's the physical appearance. A offspring or a child can come from two parents that don't look like them, and what happens is they can inherit recessive traits. So it is possible for someone to show a physical appearance other than the one shown in their parents, and this is an example of a recessive phenotype being shown. Whenever you talk about your genes, like the actual letters, the alleles, big S, big S, little s, little s, um, one of each, big and little, that's talking about your genes or your genotype. You can see genotype being exhibited as phenotype in some cases, but you can't always determine what the genotype is just by looking at someone. Because as shown before, you can have a dominant trait just by having one dominant trait from one parent. And so it's hard to tell if you have completely pure traits, um, all dominant, one from mom, one from dad, or you could be uh, mixed, and you could have a dominant trait from mom and a recessive trait from dad, but only show one or the other. Humans are tricky because we get into the mixing of traits or polygenetics, where you can actually mix traits, for example, like African American and Caucasian can make a mixed kid, and instead of just one dominating over the other, both genes can be expressed at the same time. Um, and so you can get into those topics such as incomplete dominance and codominance. But for this class, I just really need you to understand what phenotype and genotype is. So when we start talking about how genetic diseases are inherited, and I say it's recessively inherited or it's dominantly inherited, or the really tricky one we're going to get into called sex-linked, you kind of know what I'm talking about, genotype versus phenotype. Some rules to know for genotypes. Um, scientists, if they don't have a key telling you what letter is representing a certain trait, then usually we go off of the first letter of the dominant trait. So let's take hair color. Let's take B for brown and B for red. Why would you use B for red? Well, in this case, 
We use capital and lowercase letters to signal which one's dominant. We also want to pick the first letter of the dominant trait. So B, right off the bat, would tell me that brown would be dominant over red. Well, then how would you know what's dominant over brown versus black? They both start with B. This is why you have to have a key. In this example below, a capital B would be brown. The reason I use a lowercase b for red is because the red doesn't get to have the letter R in there at all because it's recessive. It's, it's lower. It's hidden. It's mass. It's not the line leader. Think about it that way. So recessive traits are lowercase, but we still use the same letter as we did for the dominant. So if I said somebody's genes or genotype was capital B, lowercase b, I'd be telling you that they're a mix, that their hair color would be a mix between brown and red. Um, but a lot of the times, we don't get a mix. We get one dominating over the other, and the other one's completely hid. Like example is sickle cell anemia. We're going to talk about how you can be a carrier and not have the disease, not have any kind of symptoms, because your healthy genes, the dominant ones, mask the unhealthy genes, like the sickle-shaped ones. Then there's other patterns of dominance where this isn't the case, and we'll get into that next. The three common ways we describe genes or genotypes is by using the words homozygous and heterozygous. Notice here, I added the heterozygous at the bottom. It's bolded. Make sure on your PowerPoint you add this in, because I left it off before I started recording. Um, but homozygous refers to two genes, two alleles, that are the same. They're either both dominant or they're both recessive. So in dominant genotypes, you have to have at least one capital letter. But in recessive genotypes, they both must be lowercase. Notice the bolded one, heterozygous, which means a mixture, is capital B, lowercase b. That means that the letters or the alleles are not the same, but in the examples we're going to use for this class, for example sickle cell, the big B masks the little b. Um, in other cases like polygenetics and incomplete dominance, codominance, we can get into tricky examples where you could actually show both at the same time. But just for this one, understand that the big B masks the little b. It's almost like the little b doesn't even exist, so we'd still be saying it's a dominant physical appearance. Um, so this is why it's important to know that when you look at something and it looks dominant, you don't know if it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant until you go into the DNA and the genes and take a look. This brings us to our first genetic disease that's inherited that we're going to talk about for this class, sickle cell anemia. You should already have some background on this if you've been following along in class, but sickle cell anemia is autosomal recessive. That word autosomal just means it doesn't really um, matter if you're male or female. It can happen in both sexes the same. Um, it's not sex related. It's not related to if you're male or female. It's anyone has the same chance. We did learn, though, in class that it's, it mostly affects ethnicities such as African and Hispanic because of the origins with um, mosquitoes and malaria and whatnot. Um, you should be familiar with most of these characteristics about sickle cell, like that it's a substitution mutation and that what it does to the hemoglobin, it's abnormally shaped and the features aren't the same as normal hemoglobin. The part I'd really like you to pay attention to on this slide is the figure on the bottom right hand corner. It shows a male and female partner and their future genetic offspring or babies. It shows that whenever something is inherited recessively, you're a carrier if you only have one trait for it. You're unaffected if you don't have any traits for it. And the only way you can actually show the disorder is if you have both recessive traits from one from each parent. So in this figure, a dark black box is representing um, a person who is a carrier, half of their DNA. So two boxes represents their alleles, one shaded box is a carrier, two is affected. That'd be like having two lowercase letters, or in this case S for uh, N for normal, or whatever letter you'd like to cho choose, H for hemoglobin, but affected would have to have one from each parent. If you take a look, there's four offspring there, only one of them has the disorder, two of them are carriers, and one of them doesn't. So if you broke it down to potential chances, not actually four children, I think about it as 100% is 25 for each child. So in this case, you have a 25% chance of having a child with sickle cell, 25% chance without, and 50% chance that your children are going to at least inherit one trait. That brings us to our next genetic disorder called Best disease. We haven't talked about this disease much, and uh, this disease is known to hit 
in the early teens and it starts with your eyes um, becoming the your sight becomes lost it's called macular dystrophy um, and basically you go blind this is an autosomal dominant disease which really stinks because all that means is that if one trait in your family passed on that's dominant and you get that trait you're you're going to get the disease you don't have to have one from each um, because it's dominant it's a capital letter for example if you have one big B and one little B it's not like you're a carrier anymore you you have the disease two big B's for besties you have the disease the only way not to get it is if you inherit the um, recessive traits from your parents for being normal so you could have a mom and a dad both with best disease and still have a chance not to get it if you inherit the um, recessive trait if both of your parents are heteros I guess However, if you've got a parent that is completely pure or homozygous dominant, two big Bs, you're for sure going to get it. Take a look at the pictures below to kind of figure out how that works. Uh, best disease comes from a shame, frame shift mutation on chromosome number and that will play a bigger part when we get to the laboratory portion of this activity, 331. The last disease that we're going to talk about is hemophilia, but before we can talk about that, I need to make sure you understand what a karyotype is and how it helps determine um, what sex you are or if you have any sort of abnormalities with your chromosome number. So as you know, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, pairs, there's two there each. Take a look at the three karyotypes in the bottom. Uh, these are pictures of all 46 chromosomes, but scientists go in and they arrange them by size and type. So the biggest two here are chromosome pair one. The next smallest ones are chromosome two. Go all the way through until they're numbered to chromosome pair 22. And then the last pair is called our sex chromosomes. Those two can either be two X's or one X and one Y. You'll never have two Y's. There's not a genetic um, disease or anything like that that just produces two Y's. So to determine the sex of someone, you will look at their karyotype at the genetic level and if they have an X and a Y they're male if they have two X's they're a female if you notice here the first karyotype is a male the second one's a female the third one shows how you can use a karyotype to determine if there's a disease present you're only supposed to have two chromosomes for every pair that's why we call it a pair but sometimes weird abnormalities happen um, because of the way that the sperm and egg either separate or don't and during fertilization in this case one of the parents gave their child two of their 21st chromosomes and the other parent gave them one. You're only supposed to get half your DNA, one chromosome from one parent, one chromosome from the other, but sometimes they stick together and you get mutations such as trisomy 21. Trisomy 21 is also called Down syndrome. Trisomy 21, three 21st chromosomes. There's three there instead of two. Um, so I hope you guys either remember which one's male and female. I hope you can remember this very big deal when it comes to hemophilia because if a man passes on his X chromosome to his daughter that's what he's gonna get a daughter a woman can only pass on an X chromosome because she doesn't have a Y so anytime um, a woman passes on her DNA she's gonna give one of her two X's to her daughter but then the male will either give an X or a Y if he gives his X it'll be a girl if he gives his Y it'll be a boy this next frame shows kinda how that happens take a look at the picture um, on the left is the mom's gametes, on the top is the male gametes, the dad's. So think of that as um, a sperm, two sperms in the top, two eggs on the left. It's a random combination who gets who. If the dad gives his offspring his X, then it's a girl. If the dad gives his offspring his Y, then it's a boy. That's how certain diseases can be linked to sex. If the disease is found on the X chromosome, then it can be passed on from mother to daughter or from father to daughter. But if it's found on the Y chromosome, only males could give it to hit their sons. Um, please take a look over hemophilia. What it does, it causes a really bad clotting disorder, uh, the inability to clot your blood, which can cause people to bleed out. Um, the examples of how hemophilia is inherited. Males only have one X chromosome, which makes the disease dominant in males. But because females have two X chromosomes, they must inherit one from each parent, since it's a recessive sex-linked disease. And so there are no male carriers in the disease hemophilia. If they have a trait for it, it there's nothing for it to mask. The Y chromosome can't hide it, so they get the disease for sure. Um, but if females are carriers, they might not ever even know they have this disease. Um, go on, pass it on to their children. I'd like you guys to do some further research on your own. Watch these video clips, read this article, take notes over all of these things. These go over it a lot better than I have in this clip.
and a lot slow and with some animation. So take some time and go over these video clips.